Okay, so today I want to talk about refactoring legacy code, and this whole talk is based on a code kata, which is like a code exercise that you do to practice your skills, uh, called the Gilded Rose Kata. Sandy Metz has been doing a talk this year based on this kata. She goes a different direction than I do. Um, there's a whole bunch of katas on a site, CMU something, Todd Sedano, who's down here, uh, maintains that site, and there's a lot of really cool exercises. Anyway, this is a cool kata, and you should actually try it out sometime, but I'd actually ask that you wait until after my talk to <laughs> pull it down. All right, so we are starting a new job today. We're working at the Gilded Rose Inn, which in addition to being an inn, sells a bunch of interesting items, and they have an inventory management system, and the previous developer left, and they need us to come in and take over the system. The system runs as a nightly process and updates... Um, how many days we have left to sell the item, and how the quality, or what the quality of the item is. So as items age, they degrade in quality, and different kinds of items have different rules. It's pretty straightforward. There is a spec. We have no idea if we can trust it. Like most legacy code, specs are out of date. They lie. They're wrong. Uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. We'll come back to it later, but we don't know if we can trust this spec. There is a constraint. This team does not practice collective code ownership. And there's a very grumpy guy in the corner that maintains the item class and does not let anybody else touch it. Now, this is our first day at work, so we're not going to kind of come in and rock the boat and try to solve this team issue. We're going to hold off a little bit. Um, and so we're going to respect this constraint for today. Our task is to add support for a new kind of item called a conjured item. And a conjured item is just like a normal item, except it degrades in quality twice as fast. That seems pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at the code. There's the forbidden item class that we're not allowed to touch, and we're only going to look at it to notice there's nothing weird here. There's no weird side effects. It's just straight accessors, getters, and setters. No magic, no weird side effects. And that's important when you're dealing with legacy code because you need some firm ground to stand on while you reason about the code you're trying to clean up. So that's all I'll say about the item class, but that's a very important point. Uh, this is our database. That's a fairly interesting database. Um, notice at the bottom there, there is a conjured item in the database already. Um, it probably is not being handled correctly. We don't know that yet. And then there's this update quality method. And I mean, we have a task to do. We have to support these new items. That looks like maybe where we want to look. So let's look at that code. OK, it's been a while since lunch, been a while since snack, so hopefully it's OK to look at this right now. That's nasty, but wait, there's more. <laughs> OK. Let's look at the tests. Tests should be better, right? There are no tests. None. Not one. Public service announcement. Please write tests for your code. All right, so what are we going to do about this? There are lots of techniques for dealing with legacy code. Um, in fact, we could probably write a book with all the techniques in it. Unfortunately, we don't have to because Michael Feathers already did. If you work with legacy code at all, you need this book. It is awesome. Second thing, we need some safety. We need tests. And so I'm not going to talk about writing tests for legacy code. That's a different talk. But when I was working through this for this talk, I wrote what Michael Feathers calls characterization tests. Because what I want to do is preserve the existing behavior of the code. Whether it's right or wrong, I want, I want to make sure that I don't change that behavior while I'm doing my work. And so I wrote characterization tests. I used SimpleCov to make sure I got 100% coverage. And everything I show you in this talk, with one exception that I'll point out, kept the test green the whole time. Okay, And that's important. I, w I made sure I didn't change the visible behavior of this code when I was refactoring it. So we're not going to trust the spec, like I said. And we are going to fight the urge to rewrite. When we don't know if we can trust the spec, we don't know if we can safely rewrite. I mean, everybody I've seen do this kata takes the spec and looks at the code and says, I'm throwing that out, I'm going to rewrite it. We're not going to do that. Rewriting is often very expensive and very error prone, and you can't always do it. So we need to have some techniques in our tool bag for when we can't rewrite. What do we do instead? We're going to follow the Boy Scout rule. We're not just going to hack in our change and perpetuate the evil that's in that code. We're going to leave the campground cleaner than we found it. So we're going to try to improve the code in the area where we're working. So we're going to take a lot of baby steps, very tiny refactorings that add up to big changes. But we're not going to boil the ocean. We're going to stay focused on our task. So we're only going to be really messing with the code that we have to touch to implement this new feature. It would be tempting to go rewrite the whole thing, but that's not what we're doing here. All right, and Kent Beck has this great advice. For each desired change, make the change easy, which may be hard, and then make the easy change. And we're going to do that. 
All right, so we have to stay focused on our tasks. Are we there yet? Can we see an easy way to implement support for conjured items? Not one that leaves the campground clean. So let's see what we can do about this code. We're going to start. This is the time when we know the least about this code. And so we just want to start getting our hands on it a little bit. And we're just going to do some really simple mechanical changes to try to improve things. Um, I used RubyMine for this talk, and it's got some great refactoring tools, and I use those a lot in here. So a lot of these refactorings I'm talking about can be automated in something like RubyMine. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, I, like, I found this quote when I was preparing the talk, and I had to put it in there. When you start a new programming job, you have to walk right up to the biggest function in the yard and refactor it in front of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of some noise so we can start to see the structure of this, of this code a little bit. The first noise I see is this at items i everywhere. There's actually 34 instances of it in this, in this code, the two pages. So let's extract that to a temporary variable. Um, Martin Fowler calls it extract temporary or extract variable. I forget the exact name. So we pull that out. We have this variable at the top. And that's a little bit less noise. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. So we've got this loop and an assignment. And then we've got 40 plus lines of code that all refer to item. That method's doing two things. It's looping and it's messing with items. Let's extract those 40 plus lines of code into their own method. That's better. And that loop is kind of weird for Ruby. Um, it is using a Ruby range, which is kind of neat. This code was actually ported from C Sharp, so that's why you see some of this stuff. But there's a much more idiomatic Ruby way to say that. And I'll zoom in a little bit. An idiomatic code is more readable. And so we're going to try to make the code a little more idiomatic so that you can see at a glance what it's doing. You don't have to study it. It's like, oh, OK, that's just looping through all the items. So we can use an each here. And that's a little better. Now, this method is pretty clean. And it's kind of an island of sanity in this sea of chaos. And we have a place to stand while we work. OK, back to the update method. There's still some noise in here. Notice all the conditionals are wrapped in parentheses. I assume that's a holdover from the C sharp. Ruby doesn't need those. Get rid of them. There's a semicolon near the bottom. Ruby doesn't need it. Get rid of it. Getting rid of noise. All right, there's actually two more parentheses I could get rid of. Yes, I know, Ryan, but I'm not getting rid of them anyway. Um, Ah, yes. So we have this item quality equals item quality minus 1 or plus 1. Ruby has the minus equals and plus equals operator. And again, that gets rid of a little bit of noise, a little more idiomatic, a little bit cleaner. All right, are we there yet? Can we do conjured items yet? No, I don't think so. So the next thing is there's a code smell in this code known as feature envy. So let's get rid of the feature envy. So what feature envy is is when you've got a method that is way too interested in the internals of another object. You see all those item dots in there? That's a clear sign of the feature envy smell. There's all the stuff we're doing to items rather than asking items to do that for us. So we'd like to extract the body of this update method over to the item class, except that we have this constraint. We're not allowed to touch item. So we have to come up with a different strategy here. We've only been working here for a few minutes, and so we're not really ready to address the grumpy guy in the corner. So we need to do something else. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap the items in another class, and then we can move some behavior onto the wrapper. And to do that, we can use something from the Ruby standard library called Simple Delegator. So I've implemented a class called Item Wrapper that inherits some Simple Delegator. What Simple Delegator does is it, it, you construct it on an object, and any message you send to the delegator that it doesn't understand, it forwards on to the original object. So this little refactoring right here where I introduced this class did not change any behavior because all the messages we're sending to item get sent to the wrapper, which forwards it on to the item that we're wrapping. But now this gives us a place to move some behavior to. So now we can take the whole body of the update method and move it to a method on item wrapper. There are some tools that can actually do this refactoring automatically. VisualWorks Smalltalk has a refactoring called Extract Method to Component that does this for you. RubyMind does not, so we're going to do it in a few steps by hand. So first of all, we're going to copy and paste that whole body of, uh, of the update method, move it to a method on item wrapper. And because I don't want to change those 43 lines yet, I introduce a temporary variable called item, which is the same name that the parameter had, and just assign self to it so that I'm actually talking to the object, but I'm doing it through a temporary variable just so I don't have to change those 43 lines of code yet. Now, that update method at the bottom really isn't carrying its own weight, so we can go ahead and inline that. It's called inline method refactoring. And you can see there, item wrapper dot new on item dot update. All right, and now we can go look at that the item wrappers update method, and we can inline that temporary variable now. 
which is actually worse, but now almost all of those self dots are completely unnecessary because when you're calling a getter on self, you don't need self dot. When you're calling a setter, you need it, so we have to keep some of them. That's starting to look a little bit more readable. Are we there yet? Can we do conjured items yet? No, still not. I'm not seeing it anyway. The code is better. We've left it better, but it's not a great way to, not, not a great thing. Now I see some duplication. So let's get rid of the duplication. First of all, duplication is a place for bugs to live because you fix you know, n minus one of the places where the code is duplicated, but you miss the other one, and you get in trouble. And the other thing that removing duplication does is it allows you to give things names that can help the code communicate better. So the first duplication I see is this whole phrase, if quality is less than 50, self.quality plus equals 1. Let's extract that to a method called increase quality, like so. Now there's one more case that looks like we could extract it, but not quite because there's a nested if inside of it. So let's dive in and look at that a little bit. Um, what I'd like to do is pull that inner if out a level, but in order to do that, I have to make sure that it's safe to do that. So this is the first refactoring we're doing where we actually have to think a little bit about the code. Everything else up to this point has been very mechanical. This one we have to think about. So what's it doing inside that inner if? Well, we're comparing against name. We're comparing against cell in. We already saw that name and cell in are just simple getters. There's no magic there. And then there's two calls to increase quality. Those calls both are protected by an if quality is less than 50 down at the bottom. So we can safely pull that if statement out a level like so, and now we've got exactly duplicated code and we can replace that with a call to increase quality. All right, there's another instance of duplication in this code, and that's this phrase. Now this looks like it might want to be a decrease quality method, but there's this extra comparison against name in there that really doesn't belong in decrease quality. So again, we have to reason about this a little bit. And what we see is we've got these two nested if statements, there's no else clauses to worry about, and the two conditions are completely independent. It's not like we're checking for nil and then sending a message to the object that we're sure is not nil. These are completely independent, so we can just reverse them. Okay, again, we had to think about that a little bit, but it, not too bad. All right, and now we can extract a decrease quality method. And that's better. Okay, are we there yet? Can we do conjured items yet? I'm really not seeing it. But what I am seeing is that there's kind of three main sections to this method. The top section is all about updating the quality. Then there's this little tiny middle section that's about updating the sell-in date, or sell-in days. And then the bottom section, which is also about adjusting the quality. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to group similar tasks. So what I want to do is I want to move that sell-in clause in the middle either up to the top or down to the bottom. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. If we move it to the top, what our method looks like is we're adjusting the sell-in date of the item and then we're adjusting the quality based on that new sell in date. That seems to make logical sense to me. That seems to read very well. So I'd like to move it up to the top. But if I do that, sell in is going to be one less than it used to be, and so I have to adjust those other two if statements that talk about sell in in there. So I'm going to do that. Again, we had to think about this a little bit. Still not too complex reasoning, but we do have to think, and we have the, te the characterization test to protect us if it goes wrong. So now we've moved that up to the top, and we'll zoom back out and see the whole method again. Now we've got this method that does two distinct tasks. So let's extract those and give those names. So we're going to first extract the top part and call it age. And then we'll extract the bottom part and call it update quality. Okay. So now update is a very nice, clean method. It says exactly what it does. It actually follows something Kent Beck calls the composed method pattern, um, which I'm not going to go into here. But it's a very nice, clean method. And that's actually our top level entry point in the item wrapper class, if you remember. So you look at the item wrapper and you say, oh, to update an item, I age it and I update its quality. I understand that. That makes sense. Now can we do conjured items? We made it better, right? No. It's still pretty nasty. So I think we've finally got to the point where all we can really do is tackle these nasty conditionals. So it's time to simplify those. So this is where things get ugly. But now we've got our hands on the code a little bit. We've kind of got the feel of it. We're starting to get a sense of it. And now we're feeling a little more confident in our ability to tackle this code. And that's, that's a good thing. So the first thing I see is that all of these conditions are negative, not equal to, not equal to, not equal to. And negative conditions are generally harder to reason about than positive conditions. So I'd like to reverse those. Now, there's the inner ones where name not equal to sulfurous. There is no else there. Those ones are harder to negate, so we'll ignore that. But let's zoom in down at the bottom on just the backstage passes check. And I'd like to negate that and make it an equals equals rather than a not equals. And to do that, you just have to swap the then and the else parts. 
Okay, just reverse those. So that looks like this. Okay, so now it's a positive check, not a negative check. And we can zoom out one level and do the same thing with aged brie. And then we can go look at the top condition now. And I like to do that here, but this is a compound condition. It's a little more complex to negate that condition. We still swap the Z and the L, so that's fine. But that condition is harder to reverse. And thankfully, Ryan already taught you about De Morgan's Law. I'm going to teach you about it again, using Ruby this time instead of circuits or gates. So if you want to negate A and B, so A and B is false if either A is false or B is false. And that's basically what De Morgan says. And then there's a the version for switching ORs to ANDs. So let's apply that to our code. So there's our condition. We want to negate it. And then we apply De Morgan's Law, which looks really ugly. And then we simplify those, all those knots. Okay, so four quick steps there. And now we have the inverted condition. And now we can apply that back to our code, swap the then and the else parts like we did before. And that looks like that. Okay, next let's look at the overall skeleton of this, of this method. Just the ifs and the else's. Notice this pattern where there's an else with a nested if and else with nested if. Ruby has an else if keyword that allows us to get rid of a lot of that nesting. So that looks a little better. And we can look at that in full context here. The next thing I want to do is I want to look at this a little bit. At the bottom of both of these if clauses, there's an else if name not equal to sulfurous, and then we do nothing. So let's zoom in on that a little bit. If name is sulfurous, this whole method does absolutely nothing. We skip everything. And so what I want to do is I want to take these two duplicate conditions and extract them up and make them a guard clause in the method so that we just return if it's sulfurous and forget about them for the rest of the method. Okay, so that looks like that. And then we zoom out a level. Notice that age does almost exactly the same thing. And we can quickly invert that condition, make it a guard clause, and make it exactly the same. Now we've got two methods that have the exact same guard clause at the top. And they're both called from a higher level method. And that's the only place they're called from. Because we just extracted those two methods. We know that. So we can move that guard clause up a level. And Kent Beck just wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago uh, about something called call graph refactorings. And this is kind of a call graph refactoring. Um, I actually exchanged some emails with him on the topic to make sure I understood it. And I'm not sure I do yet. But I, want to pre I appreciate his, him taking the time to answer me. Um, so we'll do that refactoring right there. All right, now we can go back and look at update quality again. That compound conditional is bothering me, especially when we're checking backstage passes almost twice right in a row. So what I'd like to do is split that compound conditional and kind of merge the backstage passes cases. And to do that, we have to duplicate that one increased quality line. And that looks like that. Okay. Notice these are all really tiny baby step refactorings all along the way. Now, if you look at the top if statement and then the if statement that's nested in the if cell in less than zero at the bottom, those if statements have the exact same structure. And switching on the name of the item seems to be an important concept in this code. Remember, kind of our system description talked about you know, different kinds of items have different rules. I want to kind of unify those, those if statements together. And to do that, we kind of have to distribute that cell in less than zero check to all the conditions. So I'm going to first merge the, the bottom else clauses. That looks like that. So we decrease quality, and then if cell in is less than zero, we decrease quality again. Repeat that for backstage passes, and re repeat that for aged brie. And now we have this method with the top level, switching on the name, and then logic for each of the cases. OK. Are we there yet? Can we do conjured items yet? This is the first time I feel like I can confidently support conjured items and actually have it work and have the code not be significantly worse than it is now. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. Now we're going to make the easy change. We spent all this time making the change easy. Now let's make the easy change. So there's our code. And remember, conjured items degrade in quality twice as fast as normal items. So we just add a new clause for conjured items. We're comparing against the name just like the other guys do. Now notice we have to call decrease quality twice. I really wanted to write this code. But that fails to test. And the reason is that decrease quality does a check to make sure that quality never goes below 0. So we have to stick with this for now. Okay. So at this point, we've actually implemented our new feature. Um, this is where I had to change the test uh, because conjured items actually have different rules, and I need to make the test reflect that. But I didn't change the test for any of the other kinds of items. And our tests are green again. We could stop here. 
Um, but we still have some time left, so let's see if we can make the code just a little bit better. You know, we still have some time left for this feature. So we want to express some important ideas in the code. And the first idea comes in these two methods, the decrease and increase quality. They're expressing an idea from the spec, which is that the quality of an item is never negative, and the quality of an item is never more than 50. But the problem is they don't express it at the lowest possible level. There's other ways we can set the quality that don't go through these checks. And that's why we had to call decrease quality twice. So I want to push those down a level. So what we can do is we can introduce a quality equals method here. Now remember, we're on item wrapper, which is a simple delegator. So by calling super, we're calling simple delegator's version of, of quality equals, which it doesn't understand, so it forwards it on to the original item. Again, this is really a, a, a no-op with an extra method in there, but it gives us a place to move some behavior. So we can take that quality greater than zero check from decrease quality and push that down to the quality equals method. We have to recast it a little bit because it's a new context, but it's basically the same check. So we just say if quality's less, new quality is less than zero, then make it zero. And we can do the same thing with the quality less than 50 check. And that's a little bit cleaner. Um, there's more you could do to refactor that. There's actually a proposal uh, for Ruby to add a method called clamp to numeric types that does this for you. You just say uh, new quality dot clamp 050 and, and that would work, but that hasn't been implemented yet. Um, now, decrease quality and increase quality really aren't pulling their own weight anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and inline those. So we extracted them because they were duplication, but now we've simplified them enough that we're going to inline them back. It feels like we're waffling a little bit, but we're really not. We kind of learned some things by extracting them, and now we can put them back in. So inline decrease quality, inline increase quality, and now we have those duplicate quality minus equals one lines that we can finally merge together and get the code we wanted in the first place. So that's better. There's another idea that's not being expressed in this code. Everywhere where we touch quality, we're adjusting it by some amount. And so there's this concept of a quality adjustment that seems like it might be important. Now, I, I did this refactoring in probably six or seven steps, which I don't have time to run through, so I'm just going to show you the final product. So update quality now just says self.quality plus equals quality adjustment, and then quality adjustment goes through all the cases and computes what the quality adjustment should be. Okay. And now what we can do with that, let me just double check if I know where I am. Yes. All right, so there's another refactoring I want to do here. We have this big, long conditional, and all those cases are independent. And there's a refactoring called replace conditional with polymorphism. So we're going to do that next. Um, so we have our item wrappers. And what we want to do is we're going to make subclasses of item wrapper and push behavior down to those subclasses. So the age brie will go to an age brie subclass and so on. Pardon me for a second. Um, in order to do that, we need to create the right kind of subclass off of an item. So we're going to introduce something called a factory method to item wrapper. And I'm just going to call it wrap. Notice it's self.wrap. It's the class method. And all it does right now is delegate to new. Again, we're introducing a place that we can move some behavior to. Step at a time, very small steps every time. Okay, and we're calling wrap instead of new down below. And now we can look at the aged brie case. Now we can introduce an aged brie subclass. So the factory now says, oh, if item name is aged brie, then make an aged brie, otherwise make a regular item. Aged brie itself just inherits from item wrapper, does nothing special, but now we can take the aged brie case of quality adjustment and push that down. Okay, and now we can, re we can do that again for backstage passes and for conjured mana cakes. And now our quality adjustment method is pretty clean, and all of the checks against name are up in that factory method. There's no checks for name anywhere else with one exception. We still have that Sulfuris check down in update. So let's make a subclass for those. Look at the spec. It says Sulfuris, being a legendary item, never has to be sold or decreases in quality. So we're going to make a, a legendary item subclass and add that to the factory. And then we can push down the Sulfuris behavior of update down to that subclass. Well, what happens in update if the name is Sulfuris? Absolutely nothing. We need an empty update method. And when I have one of those, I tend to put a little comment in there just so the next guy coming along, next person coming along, uh, doesn't think I, I forgot to put code in there. I want to make it clear. All right, so now our factory is the only place where we do name checks. We can look at that a little bit closer. And there's one more little simplification we can do here, and we can use a case statement that makes it read just a little bit better. All right, so now we want to express some domain concepts. We have a few minutes left to do that. I'm going to have to go through this pretty quick. But let's look at our spec. So once the sell-by date has passed, quality degrades twice as fast. 
Does this code say that? Kind of implicit. It sort of does, but not really. So this is about, oh, cool. Uh, this is about five or six little baby step refactorings. Oh, cool. I lost my, there we go. To get to here. So quality adjustment now says if cell ends less than zero, then use a pass date adjustment, otherwise a normal adjustment. Normal adjustment is minus one. Pass date adjustment is two times normal adjustment. So now that's saying quality degrades twice as fast. That's better. Next line in the spec, age debris actually increases in quality the older it gets. That doesn't really say that. Uh, again, five or six steps, and we can get to here. Now this is a little bit weird. Normal items adjustment is minus one. Age debris increases instead of decreases, so we just negate the super, super class implementation. That might be a little too coupled. I may not actually do that for real. I did it here. Because it, to me, it expresses the idea that it increases instead of decreases. It's the opposite of what the base class does. Conjured items degrade in quality twice as fast as normal items. That doesn't really say that. That does. Again, five or six steps to get there. And finally, backstage passes. Uh, first, one of the things it says is the quality drops to zero after the concert. So we can use this past date adjustment that we have in the base class and just override it and return minus quality. It doesn't quite say it drops to zero, unfortunately. It doesn't read quite that cleanly. I might do a little more work on that, um, but it's not bad. And then we can look at normal adjustment. We can clean it up just a little bit. Again, this is a few steps. That reads pretty good. Now let's look at the rest of the spec for backstage passes. Quality increases by two when there are 10 days or less, and by three when there are five days or less. Does this say that? Pretty close but the spec says five days or less and 10 days or less. This code says less than five, less than 10. That's a mismatch. Is that a bug? We don't know. Maybe the spec is out of date. Maybe the code is wrong. We are not going to blindly fix that bug because there might be people relying on that behavior or other systems downstream. A lot of times in legacy code, one bug masks another bug. So when you're working in legacy code, you really have to be careful to preserve behavior until you can find out more information and decide if that's really a bug and whether you should really fix it right now. So we are not going to do that. So let's quickly review the final code. Remember where we started. Avert your eyes if this bothered you before. Um, I actually ran flog. Thank you, Ryan, for that tool. This is where we started. The total was 179.5, and that one update quality method was 155.1. So 80, this was actually 80 steps later. There's our, our database, quote unquote. There's the new update quality method. Just loops through the items, wraps them, and updates them. There's our factory that we built. There's update and age. There's how we update quality. And there's the subclasses. Now our total is 67.1 down from 179.5. The worst method is now gilded road initialize, which we didn't touch that method, that was out of scope for the change we were trying to make. So the worst method is one we didn't touch. The worst method that we touched was actually the factory method, which was a 9.5. So our worst method went from a 155.1 down to a 9.5 of the code we touched. That's a pretty good improvement, I would argue. So what did we learn? Slow and steady wins the race. We didn't rewrite this thing. We just very tiny steps, very tiny safe steps. There's a few places where we had to think a little bit, but mostly this was mechanical changes following standard refactorings out of Martin Fowler's book. If you haven't read that book, you need to read that one too, refactoring. Um, but just very tiny steps. We made the change easy, then we made the easy change. We made simple mechanical changes first so we could get our hands on the code and start to get a sense of it. We reduced noise, we removed duplication, and we made sure we expressed important ideas and we expressed domain concepts in the code so that the next person that comes along will have an easier time with the code, and that's probably going to be us. Like Blythe said, if you don't have empathy for other people, at least have empathy for yourself. And we didn't mindlessly fix the bugs. Uh, there is a GitHub repo that has every single tiny refactoring that I did, uh, including one more I didn't talk about. So there's actually 81 in there. So if you want to go see all the micro steps I did, they're there. Um, I'll thank my company for sending me. Uh, Zeal is a local consulting company where I live that they let me come in and do this as a tech talk for them, gave me lots of great feedback. And Kent Beck exchanged some email with me. Uh, there's some references. Uh, the slides will be up on speaker deck. I don't have time for questions, unfortunately. I apologize for that. Um, 
any feedback on the talk would be great, and the slides will be on speaker deck. Actually, I think they're up already, so if you want to see them, great, and thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks very much, Randy. I'm going to go ahead and pop on.